In, in the Laws of Human Nature, I have a chapter on irrationality. It's chapter one. And I talk that we humans have certain irrational biases built into our brains. And one of them, obviously, is the confirmation bias that everyone knows about. But I talk about the conviction bias, which is if somebody talks with so much conviction, so much anger, so much emotion, so much righteousness, we tend to think that there's something real about it. They wouldn't be faking these emotions. Therefore, there must be something true to what they say. And this is what makes people on television multimillionaires. The angrier they appear, the more truthful they must be and the more audience people will reach because we have a propensity to want to have our emotions stirred, to want somebody who appeals to them, and we want to believe someone who kind of spews the anger that we're not necessarily comfortable with expressing, right? Yeah, we see this on the extreme left and extreme right yeah. on television because yeah. then those shows where they're yelling at each other and that's all they're doing, or someone says, can you believe these idiots are doing this and this and this, and it's just a bunch of people at home going, yeah, I hate that, yeah. they're the worst. Yeah, I mean, the person I think who really does that is like Tucker Carlson. Yeah. His snark, his disdain, his anger, his vitriol is what people love. That's what makes them tune in. Yeah. And they assume that he must be telling the truth because there's so much conviction behind it. So as opposed to a professor who gets up there in a very calm demeanor and sort of explains what's really going on in the world, we're going, ah, uh, what an egghead, <laughs> you know? You know, he's got some axe to grind because he went to Harvard or something. Yeah, right? he's an elitist. He's an elitist, yeah. exactly, thank you. Okay, so we are wired to have our emotions appeal to us. It's part of our nature because we're at heart emotional animals, right? We, um, emotions, uh, to give you a very brief physiological lesson, when you feel an emotion like anger or frustration or excitement, hormones are really, chemicals are released into your bloodstream that are very powerful, whereas the, pre, the, the cortex, the frontal cortex where your thinking goes on, those are like little electrical impulses that are not nearly as strong as those hormones that are charging through you, making your adrenaline pump, right? By nature, we're wired to pay attention to our emotions, whereas our thoughts, yeah, we kind of listen to them, but when we feel something, it, it engages so much of our body physically that we're... Um, we have to pay attention to it. So we are emotional creatures by nature. We are not these rational thinking animals that we like to believe that we are. Mm -hmm. And people who do marketing and PR, they know that we are emotional creatures. They know how to appeal to the animal in us. It's an art that they have developed, that they have honed, right? They call it the effective heuristic. People buy things based on emotions, not based on rational decisions. Get over the idea that you're a rational being, you're very emotional based. And a political figure, or in any, in any walk of life, or, or your boss, or whatever, if they're like always emoting, and they're like out there expressing something with so much conviction and anger and righteousness, you can believe that they're hiding something, right? They're trying to convince themselves of the truth of what they're saying. They're trying to lie to themselves that what they're saying is true, but by putting on that act, that extra bit of anger, etc., right? So con artists have always known since the beginning of con artistry that the more you feel sincere, the more you tell people, believe in what you're selling is like gold. You know, you have a gold mine, etc., that you're selling or the Eiffel Tower, the more people are likely to believe you, right? So I just want people to be more skeptical in this world when someone is spewing all kinds of emotions. And I've noticed in our age now, the social media age, that you see a lot of righteousness. That people are seeing, I am so right about the cause I believe in. Yeah, it gives outrage, yeah. Outrage. It gives me, you know, license to say whatever I want, to be as angry and violent as I want to because I'm on the side of truth. Mm -hmm. You see it a lot nowadays. I want you to be super skeptical of people like that. They're probably hiding something. They're feeling very insecure about the subject. They may very well be lying about it. Mm -hmm. You want to, like, to have some distance and be able to analyze what they're saying 
with some degree of rationality and some degree of detachment. You go around thinking everything is personal. Wow, that person was cold to me in that meeting. God damn, they don't like me. They're a bitch. They're, I don't like, something's mm -hmm. fucking wrong with her, you know? You go around, everything is personal. Oh, why did he say that? Why is my mom telling me this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling you, it's not personal. That's the liberating fact. People are wrapped up in their own emotions, their own traumas. They're reliving things from their childhood. They get angry at you, but you're not really the trigger. The trigger is something that happened to them when they were four or five or 20 or whatever. So to realize that it's not personal, that people are acting out of their own dramas, their own traumas, their own emotional problems from way back, should be a very, should kind of take all the burdens away from you. So you don't have to react and take things personally. It's extremely liberating to be rid of all of that emotional baggage that you assume from other people, thinking that they're, they have something about, against you or that they're reacting about you know, something personal. When you enter the world as an adult, the work world, it is like an arena, it is like a boxing match. Some people play by a different set of rules. Some people abide by it, some people don't. They hit below the belt, they hug you, they do all kinds of things that are not, you're not supposed to do. Um, and, you know, this is like human nature. So Schopenhauer has this quote that if you're walking down the street, and you hit your foot against a rock, you don't go get angry at the rock, right? Well, sure. people are rocks in your way sometimes. Right. They're just, and I don't mean that to, to, to depersonalize them. I mean in the sense that they are who they are. They have their own nature, and that nature isn't yours, and it's going to clash with you sometimes. And that is just what it means to be a human being, an adult in, in the world today, in any world. So... Are you going to be like complaining and blaming the fact that it is a boxing ring? Are you going to complain that people have a nature where they have an ego, where they're full of envy, where they're passive aggressive? And then in the, in the, source, in the, in the process of complaining, you're putting yourself at a continual disadvantage because you're draining yourself with all these useless emotions and you're not playing proper defense against them because you're all consumed with kind of personalizing the situation, or are you gonna have some distance and be like a boxer in a ring and be smart and intelligent about it, you know? And I just think it's a brilliant metaphor for life. It's a brilliant metaphor for being in control and for accepting the fact that some people play a little bit dirty, some people are gonna hit you, it's gonna hurt, but you don't whine and complain, you just figure out how are you gonna defend yourself better. Conflict is kind of inherent in the human condition so your path through life is never going to be easy. There's always going to be resistance. There's always going to be people who oppose you. I, I got, when I wrote the war book, I also, the other metaphor was the samurai warrior. That was a major theme in it. And Musashi talks about the stance of the warrior. Yeah. And it's the stance that matters. It's how you meet the adversary, how you position yourself, how you're calm, how you position the sword, and how you're ready for the attack. The attack might not come, or the opponent might just give up and walk away, or there may be somebody who come from behind, but you're ready, you're prepared, you're in the proper stance. So I always think of it kind of in those terms. Are you prepared? So I don't want people to be paranoid. I don't want them to go around thinking everybody's evil and they're about to attack me. I want you to be in life to have this kind of composure, this stance like a warrior. You're prepared for the worst. You're not expecting the worst, but you're prepared for it if it happens. And if some kind of crap comes your way, you know how to fight and you know how to defend yourself and you know how to get out of bad situations. And I say that because I myself, before I wrote the book, I violated a lot of times. The stance that I was in was all wobbly. I was too emotional. I wasn't strong. I wasn't like in a firm position, etc. So 